Good morning, everyone. Can we try that again? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I don't mean to be school marmish, but you know, we should start out with an energetic and rousing good morning since we have this am amazing panel. This is the, the fourth and last in our series of uh, Justice in Transition NYC, which is a series that uh, our wonderful director of communications, Mary Crowley, conjured up um, here at Vera, where we thought that it would be very important for us to set the table um, for discussion of what some of the uh, biggest challenges around justice uh, 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 that we thought existed that would be facing the new administration. And so over the course of the past few months, we've had a number of, we've had a number of discussions. I think um, this one uh, probably is the most popular of them. Um, uh, it, it sold out in a record-breaking 28 minutes or something like that. Um, and it has made us think that we now need to have a bigger conference center, which means new office space, so there's now something else to think about. But, um, but uh, I'm really very excited about this. You know, we're going to be talking about cops and courts and corrections and whether the justice system can help those with mental illness. Um, it is a really remarkable time to have this discussion uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, many of you may know that the uh, new administration just appointed a number of its key criminal justice leaders, the uh, criminal justice coordinator, Liz Glazer, um, Ana Bermudez, who is the commissioner for probation, and then Joe uh, Pont, who if you were to look at his name would actually be, you would think it's Joe Ponte, but I've been informed um, that that is incorrect, uh, who is coming from Maine to be the commissioner of the Department of Corrections. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be thinking hard and working hard on matters of segregation and isolation there, which we know are hugely important. So this is a timely discussion to have. We'll be sure that once our panel is done that we send, um, that we, we send a, a video copy to all of these folks so that they can hear about the good ideas that were discussed here today. Um, uh, just by way of introduction, again, my name is Nick Turner. I guess it's not again because I didn't say that at the outset, but I'm the, I'm the new president of Vera. I've been in this role for about, six, um, for about six months. And just a little bit about Vera for those of you who don't know the organization. Uh, we uh, got our start back in um, 1961 with something called the Manhattan Bail Project. Uh, which really looked to uh, improve the way, uh, 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 not only the way bail was administered, but really to think about an alternative to bail. It was based on a premise that people were being locked up pre-trial um, and unable to pay bail uh, for uh, reasons that related not at all to their ability to return to their further proceedings um, or uh, matters of public safety. And so in, uh, when we started that Manhattan Bail Project, what we really did was introduce this uh, concept that I think everyone is probably familiar with today, which is release on recognizance and the notion that someone, if we were to able to look at people's community ties, um, we would be able to make a determination as to whether they would be a, a good risk to be let go, knowing that they would then return to their, um, to their following proceedings. And um, in many ways, uh, you know, we have continued to think about how we can help divert people from the criminal justice system where it's uh, fair and appropriate and advances public safety. And that leads us to this, you know, another reason of why it's a very important discussion to be having now because well, Vera has always been committed to matters of mental health and substance abuse and thinking about how the system could more effectively deal with those issues or how people who are, were confronted with challenges, with mental health challenges or, safe, uh, or substance abuse challenges could be diverted from the system. Um, there's no doubt that in the past few years there's been an increase in interest in this because of the Affordable Care Act, which allows for, um, you know, I think it provides huge opportunity for us to rethink the intersection of systems, how to provide the appropriate health care now that we have parity, now that it, is, it should be easier to um, connect populations to health coverage than it has ever been before. Um, and uh, 
maybe a few years before that, perhaps a harbinger of these things to come, the, the Institute started something called the Substance Use and Mental Health Program, which is run by my colleague Jim Parsons, who is the uh, second from your, the I guess, left there, that's him waving, um, who's done really remarkable work on this and has. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it. We'll talk a little bit about the Justice and Health Connect website that we established, which is a resource for both criminal justice and public health agencies. Um, so right time to be having this conversation. Um, I just want to offer a few quick premises before we before we get started. So one premise I think that we can uh, we can establish uh, as a foundation for this conversation is that we can say that you know in general jail is probably bad for people who suffer from mental illness. Um, yet what we know is that far too many people uh, who do um, find themselves there, uh, and I believe if I have the figures right that it's fourteen and a half percent of men and 31 percent of women who are incarcerated in jail meet the criteria for some uh, serious mental illness diagnosis and and uh, you know Homer Venters who was also on our panel may be able to provide more detail on this but I think it's uh, you know at Rikers it's estimated that one-third of the people who are there um, have mental illness I think a second premise is that uh, that we can also establish is that this system is really not kind. Um, that's a, obviously a euphemism um, to people who are lead, you know, leading up to the, to the jail experience, both from their early encounters with the police um, through arraignment and, um, and um, in their interactions with the courts. But we know that there are a lot of very good um, experiments. I think Judge Demick will talk a little bit about some of them that are trying to improve that. Um, and what it's important for us to think about is that, I, that there are alternatives every step of the way um, in, this, in this journey into the criminal justice system and opportunities for, for diversion um, and connecting people with the services and the care that they need. Um, so the last thing I would say is that we've got a great deal of stuff to cover. Um, we're very fortunate um, to, to have the WNYC reporter, Robert Lewis, who is going to join us as our moderator today. Uh, Robert has uh, been a reporter at WNYC since December of 2012, and uh, he has worked at a number of newspapers across the country, including Newsday and the Sacramento Bee. Um, this has been my perhaps all-time favorite thing that I get to say in introducing someone. He, self he is self-described as a ink-stained wretch um, and it's not every day that I get to introduce someone like that and know that I'm not going to offend them because he gave us that description. Um, he is, of course, way more than that. He was a finalist for the 2012 Gerald Loeb Award um, for investigation of hard money lending in Northern California. And a lot of his work has appeared on ProPublica and Salon and ABC's 2020. So Robert, if you're ready to go, I'm gonna stop yammering up here and turn things over to you. Uh, thank, thank you, thank, thank you very much, Nick. Um, and I just wanna welcome the audience and welcome the panelists here. This is a pretty exciting day. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, as, as Nick mentioned, we are really at a very interesting time right now, uh, both nationally in uh, a lot of the discussion, a lot of the changes happening from uh, discussions over mandatory minimums, uh, things going on with solitary confinement. Uh, and locally, obviously, we have a sort of the new old police commissioner. Uh, as, of, as of yesterday, we uh, have the new corrections chief, who I know a, a lot of people are very excited about, a lot of people probably in this room are very excited about. Um, and so there are a lot of changes underfoot. Um, but the question that still remains is how will this affect the population that we are here to talk about today, those with mental illness who uh, really all too often end up in the criminal justice system. Um, as we've said multiple times, we've got a great panel today to help us understand and, and start to answer that question. Uh, I'm going to quickly introduce them so that we can get right into it. Um, and I just would note that there are complete, I'm going to go quickly, there are complete bios on your seat if you have any questions about, the, uh, about these uh, very talented panelists. Um, so seated to my right in order uh, is Dr. Homer Venters. He is the medical director for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene at uh, Rikers Island Jail. Uh, next to him is Steve Coe. He's the executive director of Community Access, which is a 40-year-old nonprofit working with people with uh, psychiatric disabilities on a range of issues. Uh, next to him is Jim Parsons, who is the director of the substance, uh, substance use and mental health program here at Vera. And uh, next to him is the Honorable uh, Matthew Demick, the judge of the Brooklyn Mental Health Court. 
Um, a brief agenda for the morning. Uh, I'm going to be talking to each of the panelists individually until about 9.30. We're going to ask them some questions. Um, we're going to have a few minutes of discussion with the panel sort of as a whole. And then I'm going to open it up to you guys, and I'm sure you're going to have a, a ton of questions, and I'll tell you a little bit about that when we get there. Um, and also, I'm supposed to tell you all that we are live tweeting this, if anyone wants to live tweet. Uh, it's hashtag JusticeNYC, uh, if you want to join the conversation and share it with the Twitter verse. Um, so let's get started. Dr. Venter, with you first, sir. Um, by some estimates, uh, there are a third of the people in jail and prison suffer from mental illness. And for some, these are very serious, like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Um, what does incarceration do to these people, and what challenges do they pose for correction staff and uh, health care providers? So jails and prisons are uniquely poorly suited to do the job that they are asked to do. That is to say, a third of the people coming into our jail system uh, have some diagnosed mental health problem. Uh, of those, about a fifth of them have serious mental illness, meet the state criteria. So when they come into our jail system, we have built up a very large, robust intake process that looks like a hospital admission so that we can do adequate mental health and substance abuse screening, determine what housing areas, determine what medication, what level of provider is needed. We spend a large amount of resources doing that. and compared to other jail systems and probably prison systems in the country, we have more process built up. However, with that process, with all these providers and, you know, prescribing probably six or 7,000 prescriptions a day, lots of work to tend to the needs of the patients, uh, we still struggle to meet their needs because, in part, jails and prisons are places with lots of rules. Uh, these generally are people that have come to us because they had some friction in the community. And so that friction in the community led them to a place with even more rules and more opportunity for friction. And, you know, and also, even in the places we try to do the best for them, to build special mental health units for people with serious mental illness, we find, like you would in the community, that we struggle to get them their medical care or other things they need. Because remember that people with serious mental illness are among the sickest medically. And their shortened lifespan is often a reflection of poorly tended to medical problems. And so we build silos in the jails like we build silos in the community. But in the community, it's much easier to break down those silos. And so you know, these are large mental health services. And we have we struggle to provide adequate medical and mental health care for them and the Department of Correction also struggles because jails are places where security must come first and prisons are the same and so there's a lot of rules that must be followed and for people who started with problems and friction in the community we've not placed them into a, a setting where you could almost predict that, that you're gonna uh, create more problems. Uh, you published a study not all that long ago on self-harm at, at Rikers, uh, and there's obviously a nexus to what we're talking about today. Could you just explain, what was the gen what, what prompted you to take a look at this issue, and what, what did you find? Sure. So we know, we look at all sorts of adverse health outcomes. We have the benefit of an electronic health record, which is the greatest single human rights tool I've ever encountered. And so we saw that over a series of years, acts of self-harm, times when people hurt themselves, were really increasing dramatically. And we wondered why it was. And clinically, we people would tell us, and we would see that that's kind of associated with going into solitary. And so we looked at 250,000 admissions over three years with self-harm as the outcome. And what we found was that uh, three things were highly predictive of self-harm, that is, odds ratios of six to eight. Uh, being seriously mentally ill was highly predictive of self-harm, which is not a surprise. Um, being an adolescent was highly predictive of self-harm. And ever being in solitary was highly predictive of self-harm. And so this, for us, we adopted a couple of years ago a human rights framework to our medical mission. And this really uh, represents what we mean by that. that we believe that we need to assess the health risks that jail confers to our patients, not simply the notion that we have all these very sick patients and any adverse health outcome is a product of their problem. It's that if you look at adverse health outcomes in jails and prisons, it is often an interaction between a personal characteristic and something that the jail or prison had to provide in terms of environment or stimulus. And so this data, we think, supports this notion that the interaction of something about the personal characteristic and something about how people are treated uh, really contributes to lots of adverse health outcomes for people and lots of money and lots of heartache for everybody who's involved in the system. And we certainly are thrilled um, with Commissioner Pont's arrival and are really eager and, and, and really in great, have great admiration for the work he's already done. And, and thrilled because of his stance on, on solitary confinement? Or? Well, I think that he has done fantastic work from the perspective of somebody who's a corrections and security expert. You know, we are 
health experts, and we know our patients, and we know medical and mental health, but what we're, you know, he has clearly displayed that you can address some of these concerns that we have on the health side and mental health side, but also end up with uh, less expensive and safer correctional settings, which is, I think, you know, something that we, we, we certainly all agree on. Um, I, I think there are many who would arguably call uh, the city's jail system the largest mental health uh, service provider, really, in the city. Um, to what extent does that size present uh, opportunities? I'm thinking of things like economy of scale versus to what extent is that size overwhelming? I think that <clears throat> it's both of those things happen uh, simultaneously. There are things that we, for instance, somebody who's having a, a first break psychosis, a, a young person with schizophrenia, you know, that may be found in jail and we can identify that person. There are lots of people who don't have access to medical or mental health services that we find when they come into the jails, we can get them medicines, we can treat them. That's the traditional like upside of you know, correctional health, I guess what you call case finding. I think that there are, however, risks to people. As I just mentioned, we believe that we need to really strongly assess the health risks that the system confers to our patients. And so, you know, it's not just, to the extent that bad things happen to people in jail that affect their health, um, and to the extent that part of that could be mental health diagnosis. So most of the, our work is about finding people who are sick, who need medicines, who need mental health care. But you know, a good chunk of our work is just specifically dedicated to taking care of people in solitary. Those people will end up with a mental health diagnosis because they hurt themselves, because we thought they did something that was, you know, but many of us in the same situation might do the same thing to escape those stresses. But those people then will leave jail with a new mental health diagnosis. And so what, we've, what we do is some of our work, not all of it, but some of our work ends up pathologizing people who don't need to be pathologized. And you know, it really harkens back to some of the work of Dubois in the 1850s, all the way up to Khalil Muhammad to say, look at the people who we put into jail and prison. And this is, I think, a component which you know, disproportionately is conferred to black and brown and poor people uh, of it, which is this like pathologization pathologization of people based on an environmental stimulus, not based on a real mental health concern. And so that's not the major part, but we have to consider that as one of the risks of being in jail. And, and briefly, if you could, what, what is it about the correctional setting that makes mental health treatment so difficult? Well, I think that we have to, it's in jail particularly, much more so than prison. You know, the median length of stay is seven or eight days. So people come in and if you, let's say you're somebody with schizophrenia and you also have one or two medical problems. So it's very hard to have three or four or five contacts with that person. We want to get them medicines every day. We want to make sure an accurate diagnosis. In a short stay setting like jails, we have a very hard time figuring out what is the problem. Like if somebody's frankly psychotic, we can identify that. But anxiety uh, versus a little mania versus withdrawal is hard to assess in 48 hours. And so the risk is that people get inappropriate treatment despite lots of resources. We have 24-7 psychiatrists. We have lots of stuff, lots of process. But still, we've asked people to do kind of an impossible job to suss out all these, uh, the, the priority and the nature of these problems. And so it's a, you know, again, it, it comes down to the risks of uh, messing up somebody's care and creating new health risks for them by putting them in this place. Um, Steve, I'm going to move to you, because uh, to get to Dr. Venters, mm -hmm. usually it starts with an interaction with the police. Um, describe a little bit through, through your experience, what, do, what are these interactions like uh, with, with, the, uh, with the police? So, um, uh, as I don't know how many people have dialed 911 uh, to seek help for somebody in a crisis, um, but when you do, uh, uh, officers show up, uh, an ambulance shows up, and sometimes a fire engine shows up. So you're, all the, you're starting with a sort of a three-ring circus. Um, so the best possible outcome is there's a lead officer, and you talk to the person really quickly and ex tell them what the situation is. The person's not dangerous because they are assumed that this is, you know, they're going to, they're coming in assuming the worst and that there's, they're going to have to control uh, the situation. So if you can explain that the person's not violent and so forth. Um, and uh, they'll, they'll listen and talk to the person. Um, they're almost always handcuffed um, as part of the procedure um, before being uh, taken out. Um, and they might be taken to a hospital or an emergency room where they'll be for several hours, um, and then sometimes to, um, to, to booking if there's a, been a crime committed. Um, uh, le lesser quality interactions will result in uh, a much more violent interaction and 
those are what we don't really you don't read about in the paper. You read about the where there's been an actual shooting, and that's that's the worst possible outcome. Um, oftentimes, the, uh, the the person who's called 911 is trying to communicate with the officers. They're not really listening. They're really going to get the person out of the way, sort of clear a safety zone, and then move in and try to control the situation. So it's got a lot of issues that. Um, and, and you're working on a, a project to change how those interactions go, and I believe it's called the uh, crisis intervention right. team. So right. Could you describe that a little bit? Sure. So um, these, uh, Memphis was the first uh, city that uh, began looking at a, a different way to have these interactions take place. And um, what they came up with, a model that you can train. There's some officers that are very um, um, adaptable and, and can ac accept the kind of training, use it as a tool so when these interactions occur that you have a different um, kind of outcome and you're really thinking about how to uh, diffuse the situation, get everybody to calm down, talk to the person to figure out what they're going through, listening to their, the words may sound confusing, but there, there's a message in there and kind of like being able to uh, ferret that out and then um, through communication and, and move the person safely um, to another location. Um, some cities, uh, Phoenix had, a, had a, a tragic incident in the 90s and came up with a whole different system so that the police come and instead of taking somebody to a hospital or to a precinct, they actually take them to a, a crisis center and the handcuffs come off after five minutes, the police loo leave and the uh, mental health professionals um, control the situation. So um, you divert somebody from all kinds of, um, not only from the jails, but also from the hospital system. How, how much training do our officers currently have in terms of they the get about They get about 40 hours of training if they're lucky. And it's during the academy. Um, and then after officers go to the precinct, whatever they learned in the academy is sort of like out the window because then the officers can say, all right, we're going to tell you really what it's like. And, this, and the idea of emotionally disturbed persons, you know, that be, becomes a very dehumanizing. And if you're male and if you're black and if you're acting um, strange, you're really, you know, you're in a very uh, compromised um, position. You mentioned the uh, Affordable Care Act. The beauty of this is that all of these people that are going to be having these interactions are also going to be on a health plan on somebody's. They'll be on Metro Plus. They'll be a part of Health First. There, And these health plans have a great deal of interest in figuring out how they can pay for a, another kind of service because they don't want to pay for somebody going to a hospital and being in a uh, locked up for you know a week or 10 days in a hospital. So we're looking at how we can create these sort of crisis alternatives here in here in New York. How, how long have you been working on these on these teams? Why has it happened so, so far? Well, we um, uh, I think the week after Sandy, um, we got together and organized the communities for crisis intervention. We knew there was going to be a new mayor and a new administration, and we saw this as an opportunity to begin um, organizing all the information that's out there. There's national conferences on this stuff. Police officers coming from all over the country workshops, trainings, all kinds of stuff is happening in the rest of the country. It's not happening there. So this was an opportunity to like pull all that information together and, and just and start advocating for it. In terms of the process going forward, uh, what's it going to take under the current administration? So we're hoping through forums like this that we, may, we get some contacts and get a conversation going inside the administration. Now we're, we're currently you know, sort of operating in the, in the community. We do have um, a lot of interest. We, we had a, a state senator introduce legislation actually to create funding for a pilot program here in New York City. It gathered uh, so much interest that, that that's now being talked about as a statewide uh, CIT program. And there's um, interest in putting funding in the budget for this cycle. So within the next couple of weeks, we could have money for pilot uh, CIT programs um, around the state. And we've given them all the stuff from Massachusetts, which rolled out a statewide program. Um, uh, two years ago. So, um, you know, there's a lot of momentum. It, everybody thinks it makes a lot of sense. It, really, there's no reason not to at least try it and find. Um, and Troy has done it. I mean, Troy has this program. So there are communities, and in, in Hicksville, so there are communities in uh, New York State right now that are doing this. It's just, um, you know, a matter of kind of getting the, the right people in the room. And, and, it's all, and the way it works is that you always have you have the mental health professionals, you have the advocates, you have family members, you have the police, you have everybody figuring out a, a system together so you don't impose some kind of uh, something that works someplace else doesn't mean it's going to. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's, there's about 2,700 uh, jurisdictions. Yeah, there's, yeah we got over 2,000 to pick from. So there's a model 
for everybody. Do, do you know where Bratton stands? Uh, stand they had a they've had a program in Los Angeles for some time, so I'm, I'm sure he's aware of it. Some communities they train civilians to ride with the police in San Diego, for instance, um, in Toronto. Um, uh, civilians um, ride in a separate car. They have a police radio, so when they hear the thing come over, the radio, they go to the scene. So then they just show up together, and then they work with the police and figure out who goes in first to have a conversation. And then, and somewhere they just train the officers, and they find the right uh, officers who can, for whom the training works. And in, in your experience, how is the relationship between the cops and, and people like yourself doing the work that, that you do? You know, I've had. I must say that the times I've called nine one one and the times I've had the interactions, I've been. Um, you know, usually impressed with the with the people that show up. Um, it's a hard job. They don't know what they're walking into. They've just gotten this call. The dispatcher, you know, is using you know emotionally disturbed person, you know, language. Uh, so, you know, but um, I'd like to say for our, my personal experiences, and, and we, I think we've said that from the very first day. This is not an anti-police. This is like when you talk to officers where this program has been implemented, they're saying it's the greatest thing. And this is, it's, it's improved community relations, it's improved outcomes. So. Uh, Jim, let's go to you briefly. Um, when people get arrested, they obviously spend a considerable amount of time uh, before arraignment in a central booking facility. And uh, there was, I believe it was a 1994 settlement where the city created these pre-arraignment screening units, which are uh, staffed by EMTs, Fire, F Fire Department New York EMTs, who basically screen the detainees and, and triage them to decide if they need some sort of care, yep. some sort of health care. Um, let's start with that system. How is it working? What have we learned since it's been put in place? So, um, thanks, um, uh, Robert. So, I mean, one of the challenges for all of this work, of course, is before you can do something more meaningful to help people who have mental health needs, is knowing who requires some kind of treatment or intervention. And for anybody who spent any time in an arraignment part in a New York City court, you'll know that that is very fast-paced, very limited opportunities to do anything meaningful in terms of screening or identifying somebody who's likely to require services. So the, the settlement that you mentioned um, was um, set up in, in the 90s to create a place where people's needs could be better identified to address the kind of negative health outcomes that were, that were happening at the time. So what happens is as someone comes into the court system, they're dropped off by the arresting officer, or they're taken in, in by the arresting officer, and then they're seen by these EMTs who work in these pre-arraignment screening units. And there's these units in four of the counties, in um, Manhattan, in Queens, in, in Brooklyn, and, and the Bronx. Um, but the problem is that these units are, they're, they're cramped, so the physical environment is not conducive to having a conversation with about someone's mental health. Um, often the arresting officer is standing over someone's shoulder and listening to the conversation. There's a few questions, they often happen very quickly. There's no access to any kind of electronic health information, any of the kind of resources which you could use to determine someone's um, mental health needs more accurately. Um, and when the information is collected, it's a paper process, so it's written down on a piece of paper and then that, that paper is rarely communicated or given to anybody else in the system. So even if you do get important information at this point, which is soon after the point of arrest. So, you know, of the 300,000 people who pass through these booking um, facilities every year, um, that's, you know, this is the point that everyone hits, um, no matter where they end up. So this is a really valuable um, point in the system, which is currently, for the reasons I mentioned, is, is not being used to its full potential, we think. And, and you're actually working on a project here to change the way that works. And could you describe that a little bit? What are you guys looking to do? So we're working actually in, in close partnership with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and we're working with Dr. Venters, is, is, is our partner on this project. Um, and we're thinking about ways that you could turn these units um, into places where uh, intervention could start. So if, if, if the crisis intervention teams, when they're set up and operational, if, if that's not a point of diversion, many people are still going to end up entering the courts. And so we're, we want to, to, to pilot a way to turn these into a place where you can start to identify people's mental health needs, determine if they need to be transferred to the hospital emergency room, because the other problem at the moment is um, people are, needs are not being identified, but also because the staff in the pre arraignment screening units don't necessarily have the training to make a diagnosis, there's a very kind of, there's a hair trigger. There's, people are often transferred to the emergency room for a, for a full kind of workup and a diagnosis. And that also is leading to wasted resources. So we're um, planning to put access, firstly, to give people working in this setting access to the electronic health record, which Homer has already mentioned, which is available in the jail, which includes detailed information on people's health needs, including their mental health needs. 
Um, and so if somebody working in the pre-arraignment setting were able to access that health record, see if somebody had been receiving treatment in the past, see if they needed medication, it would be, a, we think, a valuable resource. Unfortunately, because of the patterns of recidivism, many people who pass through the system have been in the jail before, but that does mean that there'll be a health record there that we can draw upon. Also, working with the city, we're thinking about the kind of personnel that need to be in this setting, whether having someone with, with some, some medical training who could make decisions about people's treatment needs would help this process, and thinking about the physical environment. Um, and so we think that doing this, we hope, will have a number of benefits. Firstly, of course, and primarily, is getting people the treatment they need. Having information to make decisions about who needs to go to the hospital, um, for example, and who needs emergency treatment will stop some of the tragedies that, some, that occasionally happen when people don't get the treatment they need as they pass through this system. Also, reducing the number of unnecessary transfers um, to hospitals by having better information. So NYPD aren't spending their time shuttling people back and forth between, uh, between the hospitals and the booking facilities, which often happens we think could have bigger efficiency gains. And finally, I mean, having information on who needs treatment at this point, before a case is arraigned, before they see a judge, um, we think could have a number of benefits for thinking about how you serve this population in a different um, or more appropriate way. So, for example, things like mental health courts, things like other alternatives to incarceration, we hope that providing this information <coughs> early in the court system can help kind of drive a number of different reforms. Um, and so at this point, we're working with the Department of Health to pilot it in one county as a plan to get this set up and to collect data on how it works so we can actually understand, is it leading to fewer transfers to the hospital? Is it leading to better health outcomes? Um, and uh, are people using the information that's available to them to, to kind of make better kind of decisions? So it's, it's one point. And, and of course, you know, this isn't a... Uh, one solution kind of issue, um, but we think that this is an important part of this kind of continuum. There is obviously screening that already happens, right? The, the, uh, the bail project was mentioned earlier. The CJA does some pre-screening <coughs> who, who should get bail, um, but it, it doesn't. It's not as simple, right? We were talking about this earlier. There, there are some some ethical implications yeah. and some questions. Could you could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, um, I mean, any point at which you're talking about. Um, mental illness, um, often related to substance use needs, so drug, drug and alcohol use, um, and the criminal justice system, there, there's a, a potential cause for concern there about how information is released, uh, where it's communicated, in what kind of form, because people rightly will be concerned that it could have negative repercussions for, for people who have been arrested if this information is communicated widely. And, you know, we, we have another project at the moment at Vera which is looking at the role of public defenders. So. Um, who are often concerned that if someone arrested on a minor charge, if that information is released widely in the court, that they could end up being, being kind of stuck in the system for longer because um, of concerns about their mental health or their competency to stand trial and these other kind of issues. So um, it's a, not a simple question, and, and we're still kind of figuring out the best way to feed this information to this, through, into the system. I mean, certainly public defenders seemed like, a, as the advocates for, for an arrestee, seemed to be a, a good point at which we could make this information available. Um, but again, you know, whether public defenders have the, have, always have the training they need to be able to kind of interpret information and make clinical decisions is another question. So a lot in this project, as I say, it's, we're kind of piloting this and there's lots of questions to be answered about how information should be used um, legally, ethically, and in a way that kind of maximizes um, care. Uh, it's already come up a couple times today, uh, talk of the ACA, o mm. Obamacare, um, and, and that it uh, greatly expands uh, mental health uh, services, uh, there, and Medicaid is going to be expanded for a lot of indigent people. Yeah. Um, what, does the, uh, what does the ACA mean for the work that you're doing? It's, I think it's hard to overstate the impact, the potential impact of the ACA for people um, who have mental illness and are passing through the justice system, um, because um, the... Um, ACA expands coverage to many, many childless single adults who in the past haven't been covered and haven't had any kind of health benefits. Um, now there's a real opportunity to rethink how you use that funding to provide services to people in the community. And of course, I mean, I think certainly our mission, and I imagine many of the panelists would agree that keeping people out of jail and keeping people in the community, keeping people out of jail and prison, is, is a primary aim of a lot of this work. We've heard from Homer that the jail is um, uh, a damaging place for many people who have mental illness for, for a range of reasons. 
Um, so thinking about how you can use these funds to get people in contact with services in the community and fund those, those services and provide treatment that will frankly help um, treat the behavior that often led people into the justice system in the first place is important. Um, the unfortunate fact, we, we did a study in, in Washington, D.C., and we found that of the people in D.C. who had, a mental, who had been arrested and had a mental health need, 40% of them, their only place they were getting mental health treatment was from a criminal justice provider. So these pe many, many people are not accessing services in the community, and this means that we have to use a criminal justice system as a way of identifying people who need Medicaid, enrolling them, and linking them with community services. Because when you're not going to find them elsewhere. It's not like you can work in the kind of community health centers and identify people because they're just not in touch with those services. So again, you know, and, and we think there's no wrong door for this kind of work. So the work we're doing in, in the pre-arrangement screening units, thinking about the jail, thinking about crisis intervention teams. The city has um, just set up a court-based intervention resource team program, which is setting up resource hubs in the court system to think about, you know, how you identify people and divert them to services. So um, there's a number of opportunities to, to do this work. And I mean, I think has been mentioned already, this is a really, uh, I think, um, exciting time for, for a number of reasons. New administration, um, uh, people who are working in the system who are passionate about thinking about change, um, and um, the ACA, which now provides some money to, to fund services and think, well, how, how can we do this differently? How can we kind of move the ball in New York City to think about getting many people who end up in the jail currently in contact with treatment services in the community. Excellent. Uh, Judge Demick, we're, we're going to talk to you for a little bit. Um, you run the Brooklyn Mental Health Court, uh, which was established in 2001 uh, as an alternative to incarceration for nonviolent adults, although it actually morphed at some point. You, you do take uh, some violent cases as well, I believe. Um, walk us through one of your typical cases. How does it come to you, and, and how does it work? Well, uh, just to start from the beginning, the court was planned in 2001. The Office of Court Administration and the Center for Court Innovation uh, got together. The Center for Court Innovation took the lead. And uh, before I was involved in the court, got together with the district attorney's office, the defense bar, service providers, any other players in the mental, uh, in the mental health community to try and plan the court. Now, one of the things about the court that I think is important is that the defense bar was very concerned that a person suffering from a mental illness who came into the court, who took a plea and was facing a jail term, would have an open-ended mandate that uh, uh, could harm them. They could do well for a long time. The judge doesn't let them off the hook. They finally do something wrong and they go to jail. So when the court was planned, it was decided that for a, first of all, misdemeanors weren't going to be part of it. It was just going to be, as you mentioned, Robert, nonviolent felons. So for a first felony offender, the mandate period would be 12 to 18 months. A second uh, felony or, or more would be 18 to 24 months. And then there have been other circumstances where we had attempted uh, kidnappings uh, that uh, one woman had a, uh, a mandate of five years and arson, uh, arsonist for three years. Uh, but quickly, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, it's always when you plan something and then you put it into effect, things change. So one of the first cases that was referred to the court was of a young woman who gave birth and killed the infant at the instant of birth. Now that wasn't something that the court would be able to handle, but obviously uh, it, it doesn't get much more violent than that. But to walk you through what happens is that any assistant district attorney, any defense attorney, any judge in Brooklyn can refer a case to the mental health court. We also, when, when, um, when defendants are sent for an, evalua a, 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 an evaluation to see whether they're fit to stand trial, those defendants, when they come back fit or they're found fit, come to the court as well because we felt that that would be a way to, you know, obviously if a judge or a defense attorney or a DA asks for a, an examination to see whether they understand the proceedings of the court, we felt that that might indicate that there was something going on that we could help with. So rather than those defendants go back to the uh, judge that sent them for the evaluation, they come to the mental health court first. What happens then is uh, everybody has to agree. I have to agree, the defense attorney has to agree, and the district attorney has to agree that the person should be evaluated by the court. Once the referral is made and everybody agrees, uh, then what happens is we have a contract with a psychiatrist who consults with us and he does a psychiatric examination. 
I'm lucky enough to have a clinical team, so a social worker on my staff does a psychosocial evaluation. Those are given to the defense attorney, to the DA, and to me. If the person suffers from a serious and persistent mental illness, and there's some connection with the criminal behavior, it doesn't have to be direct, you know, a loose connection, then the person would be deemed eligible for entry into the court, which, as was mentioned, is an alternative to incarceration court. At that point, the district attorney and the defense attorney negotiate a plea. What generally happens is that a jail term is agreed to up front uh, in the event of failure of the court mandate, and uh, in the event of a first felony, the case will be dismissed. So there's a lot to look forward to for a defendant who's accused of a felony. Now, at this stage, 12 years later, we opened as a pilot in April of 2002, officially in October 2002, uh, about 40% of our caseload involves people who have pled guilty to a violent felony. And um, uh, so what happens, they go into the court, the plea is taken, they go into treatment, and um, I'm glad Lucille Jackson, who's my project director, isn't here because she insisted on having, you'll find out in a second, she, she, she decided that we would have four phases of treatment, you know, for uh, like marking periods to give people to look, something to look forward to. We hand out a certificate and everybody in the courtroom, you know, applauds. And, and uh, I was a little bit skeptical of this approach because it seemed to me to be a little too warm. Would that be the, uh, <laughs> would that be the, uh, but I was wrong, and I say that, uh, I said from the first time I handed out a certificate till certificates I handed out last Tuesday, uh, and you can imagine that, you know, we're used to, you know, getting affirmation, getting accolades, and getting certificates or diplomas or whatever you want to call it, and I'm dealing with people that are used to having people running away from them, and yet here they are coming up to the bench, getting a certificate, the whole courtroom is supporting, and, and, and uh, one of the public safety measures, I'm probably getting away from myself, but one of the public safety measures that we have is that I see these defendants every week in the beginning. And so the calendars are pretty big. You know, there could be 80, 90, 100 cases on the calendar. And, you know, I did that because I felt the strict judicial monitoring was a way to ensure that I could address any public safety issues immediately. Uh, but it had the secondary effect that I didn't realize of c creating a community in the courtroom because everybody knows, everybody there knows why they're there. And everybody there knows that they suffer from a mental illness. And they see each other doing well, doing poorly, getting reprimanded or, or, or getting uh, accolades. And, and it, it, it has, a, I think, a great effect on things. In any event, the plea is taken. They go into treatment. The four walking periods, I know Lucille has, uh, I say that they mean, you know, you're here. phase one is you're here, phase two is you're still here, phase three is we're surprised you're still here, and phase four <laughs> you're graduating. But if I say that in the presence of, of my project director, you know, it doesn't go well. So I can only do that in uh, opportunities like this. But, but to, just to give you an example of, of one of the first cases, and I, I give this example a lot because I remember an older judge, I used to be able to say an old judge, but I can't do that anymore. <laughs> Uh, I saw him in the street one day, and he said to me, you know that stuff you do in the uh, mental health court? You're just a social worker. And I, uh, with, uh, with, um, with due respect to the social worker's president, he wasn't saying it to be uh, nice. So, <laughs> but I explained to him, one of the first cases that came to the court was a case of a young man, and, and I've learned a lot, uh, which means I know that I don't know a lot now, uh, about that this young man was in college, he had his first psychotic break, which the mental health professionals tell me is not unusual. And uh, he committed two street robberies in Brooklyn and uh, was caught right on the scene of one of them uh, by the police, sent to Rikers Island. He started proclaiming, proclaiming himself, you know, an angel of God, or, and he was beat up and sent to Kings County Hospital. And he, it was determined that he was suffering from schizophrenia. And so he was referred to the court and to the district attorney's credit, uh, they, well, whatever violent case is sent to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the court, the DA has a policy of asking the victim if they'll agree to um, treatment instead of prosecution. And uh, kind of another remarkable thing, I think, is that I can count on one hand the times when people have said no. And so the victim has agreed that this young man should go into treatment. And so he took a plea to the two robberies. He was facing a long jail term. His court mandate was uh, 12 to 18 months. He used to come, he was studying graphic design at Pratt Institute. And he used to come to court with his father. 
And I remember, you know, looking at the father. And another thing I do, and I'll explain if I have time uh, why I do this, but I let people come up to the bench. And so he'd come up to the bench with his father. And he did remarkably well. And um, at the end of the, but because it was two violent crimes, the district attorney's office did not agree to a dismissal at the end of the mandate period, but wanted him to be on misdemeanor probation. So the felony would be reduced to a misdemeanor and he'd be on probation for three years. At the end of the 12 months, the mother sent me a letter, sent the district attorney a letter asking for a dismissal. District attorney's office agreed with the defense attorney that he would stay with the court for another six months and if he did just as well as he did for the year, that the case would be dismissed, and that's what happened. And the last time I saw this young man uh, was several years ago, and he had gotten a master's degree in graphic design, actually. But uh, another point of this story is that when I was telling the story to the other judge, uh, I got the impression, I mean, it could have been wishful thinking on my part, that he was kind of thinking, what if my grandson uh, had a psychotic break, suffered from a mental illness, and got himself caught up in the criminal justice system? What would I want? As a matter of fact, one other judge told me that years ago he had a case, before we had a mental health court, of a young man who was obviously delusional, walked into a house in Park Slope and scared the people to death, you know, and uh, was charged with burglary, went in. They offered him a not guilty uh, by reason with, you know, not responsible plea. And he, uh, the defense attorney, didn't want to take that plea because he was afraid it's have an indefinite uh, term in a prison hospital, you know, basically, or a secure facility. And so he pled guilty, got the minimum term, went to state prison. But as uh, the judge said to me, he said, look, if we had a mental health court, we'd have a third way. No plea, no plea, not responsible, no trial. Uh, but go into mental health court, go into treatment, do well, and the case gets dismissed. So I always kind of look at this as a third way. And, and, you know, thoughtful, I didn't make it up. I mean, thoughtful people in criminal justice made this, uh, this you know, established uh, mental health courts. And, and uh, you know, they prolif proliferated throughout the country. And in fact, uh, again, through the Center for Court Innovation, I went to Scotland last year with a, to talk about the mental health court. And I also do domestic violence part and talk about that too. But uh, uh, they are seriously considering opening mental health courts in Scotland now as a result of what's happening here. And I've also had visitors from other Canada, Australia, other uh, jurisdictions of the United States. So uh, basically, that's what happens. And to date, we've had about 79% uh, of our of people have gone through the court in the last 12 years graduate. So uh, I think how many, how many we're talking about about a thousand cases. So uh, over, over what time period? Part, oh, about a thousand total since, since yeah, the about year. about two thousand have been referred. So about 51%, I guess. Uh, were deemed eligible for the court. I mean, the other thousand would be people that uh, wanted to go to trial, that you know, expressed their innocence, and and others because of they were charged rule outs. Like we wouldn't take a rape in the first degree or a murder case, or you know, we have taken attempted murder cases and things like that. Some are referred to the uh, uh, Education Assistance Corporation. The DA's office has a program called Treatment Alternatives for the Duly Diagnosed. I monitor those defendants too. So some, because they don't suffer, I mean, when I'm talking about a serious and persistent mental illness, as of today, I guess about 24% of people in, in the program suffer from bipolar disorder, about 30% from major depressive disorder, 21% schizophrenia, 12% schizoaffective disorder, and then the other 13% post-traumatic stress, some traumatic brain injury and things like that. But we wouldn't take people that just have a personality disorder, but they do get referred to uh, the DA's program and EAC. Uh, case manages those programs as well. Great, thank you very much, Judge. Um, I, I'm just going to open it up to the to the group a, a little <coughs> bit, and um, I'm actually going to direct this first question at Homer. Although I, I'm curious, everyone on the panel's thoughts. Um, the the tension between uh, treatment and uh, corrections and 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 law enforcement and sort of the punitive aspect of uh, of of everything we've been talking about today and, and the systems we've been talking about today. And, and Dr. Venters, you're in a, you're in a unique position. You're, we have one of the only systems, I believe, in the state and one of the few in the country where uh, health at the jails is independent of the Department of Corrections. You, you are part of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And I'm wondering, could you talk about that relationship a little bit? What are the advantages of it? And, and what are the tensions, as I'm imagining, must exist? Yeah. Um, so we. I work for the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, so my boss is uh, Merritt Bassett, the Commissioner of Health, and we work collaboratively with the Department of Corrections to provide health services. So 
it's in the city charter as an independent function. I think that the, the notion is that you can have a real independent health authority, that the doctors and nurses and social workers work for people whose prim primary concern is health. And I think that that's, um, you know, one of the reasons we adopted this human rights framework a couple of years ago, uh, there's a core concept in correctional health called dual loyalty, which is the notion that your, your mission as a health provider, uh, the second you start to provide care in a correctional setting, um, is impacted by the security environment. And it's impacted in small ways and it's impacted in large ways. But the second I picked up a stethoscope when I was the deputy medical director in the first jail, I felt it. And so our job is to assess that and all the other kind of uh, pressures on our health mission and then try and support our providers and engage with our patients to mitigate the potential harms that that brings in terms of our healthcare mission. But it's, on the other hand, uh, it can be less efficient uh, if we engage in conflict or adversarial interactions over uh, either an unimportant or an important point uh, or based on incorrect information. We may, you know, pay the price in terms of having kind of a, a rough patch with uh, other areas where we could have uh, made gains uh, that were less controversial. So there are downsides to it, but I think ultimately, um, our job, our mission, is to take care of our patients and to advocate for their health, and that's it. And so this system does not necessarily guarantee that that happens, and there are a lot of ways where we fall down on our mission, but it has to be that the people who take care of you uh, care about your health. And in most places in this country, not in Europe where there's a different model, but most places in this country, if you have to find a doctor or a nurse or a social worker or a psychologist, their bosses, 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 boss, ultimately is not a health person. Uh, Steve, I go to you. We, we, um, we've heard a lot about today already about the ACA. You mentioned it briefly, mm -hmm. but, but you've actually already benefited from the ACA. I believe you have a program that right. is going to get going as a result of that. Could you just talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, as a run-up to the ACA, the, um, the White House uh, put a uh, billion dollars into the uh, Center for Medicaid Medicaid Services for healthcare innovation um, grants, and so we had been trying to create a alternative to hospitalization program for several years. So we went to the city and said, let's apply for this. Let's set up a crisis center. Um, and the city um, agreed that they would, this would be the, the sole um, application that would go in for the, for the CMS uh, healthcare innovation. So they picked 106 programs around the country and they selected this, the one from New York City, which now has four um, crisis residence centers set up. Uh, we opened the first one over a year ago in Manhattan, and there's one now in Brooklyn and Queens and uh, the Bronx. Uh, they've revamped uh, the mobile crisis teams. The VNS runs some of them. Uh, Woodhull Hospital runs some. Added peer workers to the teams, added family counselors to the teams. The teams can actually now spend a year working with somebody. Um, uh, the training um, involves the family and stakeholders and the person in life so that it's, it's a much more integrated model. Um, we made the decision that we wanted people with a lived experience in the mental health s system to be our employees in our crisis center. So we, we had 800 applications. Uh, we selected 14 people. Um, we have two people on at all times. Um, and it's, we've had over 100 guests, we call it. They stay for an average of nine days. Uh, it's voluntary, so it's not the police drop-off model, but it is a model where there, if there's somebody in an emotional crisis, we can get referrals from hospitals, family members, walk-ins, you know, any, almost any place. Um, along with that, the city put in a uh, peer-run uh, support line, so that works in um, tandem with the city's crisis line, with LifeNet, which the Mental Health Association runs. This is a line where somebody, LifeNet, the uh, calls are fairly short, seven minutes, or eight minutes, there's a referral made, there's some, in, you know, there's social workers on the, uh, on the phone. Um, our line, people can call and stay on the line for 20 or 30 minutes. They're talking to, they're talking to a peer, they're talking to somebody that's had the same kind of issues. Um, we can do a warm handoff to the, to the, um, to the crisis line if there's a, we think there's an, an issue, um, and, and they can do the same thing um, for us. So it's a nice, I mean, that's only for 4 p.m. to midnight, so we're, we're hopeful that as uh, ACA rolls out in next year, and this grant period ends that we can go 24-7 with that, with that support line. So there is um, 
a model that we can uh, ramp up, we think that uh, that really works. Um, I, I direct this to you, Jim. Although, if anyone uh, is, is has a thought on this question, I'd be, I'd be curious to hear it. Um, as we sort of said at the beginning, I mean, we are at a very interesting time uh, in terms of uh, this sort of prog seemingly progressive wave of criminal justice reform. <coughs> Locally, we've, we've obviously seen a lot of discussion over stop and frisk. Uh, there's been a lot over the mandatory minimums, uh, solitary confinement. There was obviously the big uh, state settlement recently with NyQlu in the state. Um, what's the next big front in terms of uh, advocacy and, and reform? And, and I'd, I'd start with you. Yeah, I mean, so um, I know where I'd like, where I think the front needs to be. Um, so, I mean, I think that um, there's, with increased appetite for rethinking the way that the criminal justice system operates and the way particularly it deals with people who have a health need, um, I think that it, we're starting to move further upstream. So, you know, first, perhaps there was a focus on reentry, about what happens as people leave jail. Um, then there was, uh, and, and what happens inside jails and prisons. Um, now there's a, a more of a discussion about, about mental health courts and diversion. Um, but I think that, um, in, that this work needs to happen earlier, whether it's crisis intervention teams or whether it's before people encounter the, come into, in, in, come into contact with law enforcement, to think about these points in the, the education system, the points in the, the welfare system, the points in the housing, you know, the, the places, because of course the encounter with a, uh, a, a law enforcement officer for someone with mental illness uh, is the product of a range of different um, experiences and, and perhaps missed opportunities to pr provide services which can support people before they get to that point. I think there's an appetite for having those conversations now. Um, I think, again, the ACA provides some funding to do that. And I think we need to, for us as researchers and, and people who are interested in policy and advocates, we need to think about how we start that or how we push that conversation so that we, we, we can identify people earlier and we can provide services so that people can be healthy and avoid contact with the criminal justice system. Homer, do you agree? Do you, do you think uh, we're moving to the to the front end now, or is there more that still needs to be done? Uh, I think so. I think that, you know, uh, under the last administration, the CERT process was started, which was a process to find people who have come into jail who have a mental health problem who might be eligible to leave jail early. And I think that, you know, as we push forward to think about yeah, earlier time points, I think that because this is all putting aside, you know, the, the virtue of this discussion for individuals and their, like, humanity, it is incredibly expensive. Everything we're talking about, from the, from a cop car coming to going to a hospital to being in jail, that just gets increasingly expensive. You know, it's 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 four or $500 a day to hold somebody at Rikers. And so this is, these are huge amounts of resources that we've dedicated to these processes. And I think we are smartly reevaluating whether or not we might also save some money in reallocating how we how we prevent these problems. Yeah. Can, uh, can I, please. So Canada was interested in looking at this sort of anti-stigma pr program and looked all over their country to find communities where there was some, uh, they could measure some sort of difference in, in the, what happens to people with mental illness. And they found this community where the school system actually developed a curriculum, it's called Talk About Mental Illness, and they developed a curriculum so kids in school are exposed to this, so it's not stigmatized, it's this kind of, that's why people don't call, that's why they don't seek help, because the, of all the stigma around this issue. And if you can start introducing kids to this, and then the kids actually um, do projects, and then they actually meet people with sort of mental illness, and so this whole transformation of, a, um, of the thinking about, um, it's sort of what's happened with um, you know, once you, you meet a gay person, you go, oh, well, they're not so bad. So if you <laughs> meet somebody that, that has so-called you know, so mental illness and you sort of, it, it sort of humanizes them. And then, so if you can spread that across the community and then you can start having a conversation that people seek help sooner, you see somebody who needs help, they can talk to them, you can direct them to help or you can try to get somebody who you know can provide help to direct to, so the Adam Lanzas of the world and the other folks that are the loners and they're, they're, they're nobody, and people knew there was, there's issues with people in their community, but they don't have any way to, there's no resources, they don't know who to call, they don't know who to talk to. If you can get that kind of conversation going in these communities, then you start to um, really catch people much at a much earlier stage. Um, we're going to open it up to the audience now, take uh, about a half hour of questions. There is a mic that's going to be going around. I would just ask uh, everybody, we're going to try to get to as many questions as possible, so please try to keep them focused, tight. 
question for the panel. Uh, there's a woman in the front row. Raise your hand, please. Could you introduce yourself? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Jimmy Richheimer. And as it happens, I'm uh, doing an article for City Limits Magazine, um, excuse me, Mental <clears throat> Hygiene Court, which is uh, a civil, not a criminal court. And uh, in, in the course of this research, I, I've heard from uh, advocates for uh, patients who, um, or who are fighting uh, 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 forced medication or forced treatment who say that there is more due process in uh, uh, for people who do not want to be treated uh, in the criminal system than there is in the civil system. And I just wondered if you would all comment on that. And then and just in conjunction with that, when you talk, Dr. Venters and um, Judge Demick, about medication uh, and treatment, and I assume that uh, that includes medication, uh, it, how much choice do these defendants have in terms of treatment options? Well, I'll start with our system. It's constrained in that we have a health system that we, you know, we decide what medicines we use, but we do it in conjunction with a patient. So, for instance, everybody who comes into Rikers Island now, we automatically check what prescriptions they have in the community. So if they're on an, uh, an atypical antipsychotic, whatever, X, um, and they tell us that, uh, first of all, if they tell us that and we can't verify what's going on, we'll give it to them. Um, often now we can verify it's a great assistance because people who come in who are disorganized or a little confused, we can check their medications. Uh, we don't always get their information, but generally, we believe that mental health medications should be treated like medical medications. If I tell you I'm on lisinopril for my blood pressure, you'll give it to me in jail. So there shouldn't be a different assumption. There are, unfortunately, a lot of people who come in with prescribed medications that are clearly part of an addiction pattern, and that's tougher. People who come in who have, uh, you know, who have allergies to seizure medicines and are taking highly addictive benzodiazepines, uh, you know, th it's incredibly rare that somebody has an allergy to every known seizure medication and needs something. So, but it takes us a while because it's jail to undo that, but we do tell people, um, and, we, and we give them withdrawal medications, we have treatment for withdrawal for everything from alcohol to benzodiazepines to opiates, we do methadone treatment. So we want to take people at their word, but we also want to be frank and say, look, uh, if you came in and we verified that you were on two or three milligrams a day of a benzodiazepine for your seizure, we don't think that's for your seizure. We think that, you know, unfortunately, you and a, and a, a large number of physicians have fallen into this pattern. So it's, and those are points of conflict. Um, and we don't, and because it's jail and it's a short stay setting, we don't always get it right. And, and, and it creates a lot of uncertainty. But for antipsychotics, for antidepressants, we generally try and keep people on the medications that they're on. Judge, would you? Well, you know, in the mental health, it's a little bit different. Like you, know, like you mentioned, mental hygiene is a civil, I'm um, a criminal term. And I think you know, my colleague, Judge Mershon, is here from the Manhattan uh, Mental Health Court. I think you'd agree that, you know, people that come before me are pleading guilty mostly to felonies and a large portion to violent felonies. So they, they get a treatment plan when they first go into treatment. And part of that is that they have to meet with a psychiatrist once a month and they have to take medication as prescribed. So, it's between the doctor and the, the patient, obviously, what prescriptions are ne they feel are necessary. But if the doctor prescribes and the patient doesn't want to take it, and I fear the public safety is jeopardized by that, then I wouldn't have any choice but to insist that, uh, the, that he take his medication. Yeah. Uh, other questions? I, can I have, can oh, I have a response? So, the medications are extremely problematic. Um, OMH has found if you're in a state facility and if you're um, a person of color, you're going to get more medications, you're going to get higher doses of medications, you're going to get older medications. Um, so the, the, the medications have to be, you know, ideally they're done, they're part of an overall treatment approach. Um, and it's hard to have an overall treatment approach in a, certainly in a jail and in a, and in a short term hospitalization. Just a lot of medic. That's that's the treatment is medication. So that's the other advantage of having diverting people from a inpatient stay is you know let's s sleep and eat and talk to people and then we can figure out sort of then you do medical assessments and you can sort of figure out what's going on with the person before um, immediately jumping to you know doing a diagnosis and applying the 
the medication that goes with it. And, and just very quickly, we, we haven't looked at the civil process. We have um, recently completed a project which looks at treatment for people who have been deemed incompetent to stand trial. And talking to people in different settings, when we speak to people in the Kirby, the secure psychiatric facility in, that serves New York City, um, we found that, that while they have the ability to uh, provide medication over objection, because of the clinical relationship they build up in that setting, which is more of a hospital setting, that it's very rare they have to do so. So engaging a patient in a discussion about medication and um, uh, just means that they rarely have to use that option, even though they have the ability to do so. So I think a lot of it is to do with environment and, uh, and the difference yeah. between settings. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Uh, back there in the green. Rebecca Hoffman, Department of Probation. Um, thank you all so much. Um, my question is for Dr. Benters. So there's been a lot of talk recently about moving from terminating Medicaid while you're incarcerated to suspending. And what do you think about the likelihood of enrolling people in Medicaid or leaving it active, keeping it active? And then are you working on enrolling people into Medicaid health homes? while they're incarcerated or part of their discharge plan? Sure. So we do all of those things right now. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's very, like, complicated, wonky discussion. But in New York State, when people come into jail, uh, they go into, if they're in jail for a certain amount of time, their Medicaid goes into a suspended status, which is better than just having it turned off because then when they come back out, it can be turned back on quickly. So that's something that's good in New York that, I think that some places don't have. Also in New York, we have a, a, we've already gone through a Medicaid expansion of our own, so lots more people are on Medicaid than in other states. Through our electronic health record, we actually look up every single person that comes into jail right now, so we know that you know well over half are either on Medicaid or recently on Medicaid. So we're wor so all that terrain is better in New York. We also have a pilot with a local health home to find people that they haven't found and and, and work on either bottoms up enrollment or return to continuity of care, but. These things are very, to do all this is going to be very uphill for most jails and prisons because you need lots of technical infrastructure that simply does not exist. So we could build, for instance, a bilateral agreement with all of the different health homes in the state or all the different health homes in the city. But I'll tell you that we already have about 70 full-time people that work in our bureau just doing discharge planning just for people with mental illness. If you look around the country, most big jails and prisons might have five or four or six. And so because the IT infrastructure doesn't exist, you have these very labor intensive connections. And I think that what we will find is that while we're doing a lot of this work right now and pushing ahead on it, uh, most places won't be able to do it. Uh, then there will be litigation and people will be forced to do it. And I think that, you know, we'll have to figure out how to do it much with a much lighter touch. And so uh, I think that we're on a good foot to do that in New York City. I think that most places, though, will struggle mightily. Uh, other questions? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we have a peer training program. It's called the Howie the Heart Peer Advocacy Center. And so we train peers who have been in the, in the correction system as well as been homeless. And so we have internships that go people go back who have been in Rikers to go back as interns and be health sort of health navigators, so you can't do work with this. The volume is <laughs> tremendous, but that's another kind of role that peers can play is help that is beginning a conversation with people that are getting ready to be released and like, you know, what's going to happen when you go back, where are you going to live, how are you going to, you know, and help with benefits and help kind of just think about the social environment they're going back into that they can, uh, and what some of their, op some healthier options might, might be. Other questions? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Frank Cardellano. I'm a psychologist, and I work on a televisiting program that connects people, um, uh, mostly at Rikers and DOC facilities, and also a couple state facilities, to community supports. Um, so we do like family televisits, and we're also looking at other ways to connect them to supports. So a couple weeks ago, we had a, a televisit between um, someone at the tombs and their priest. Um, and so looking at the discussion about the need to break down the barriers between the community and the institutions, so for here it's um, the jails, and my internship was all inpatient units, so it's the same thing. Whether you're on an inpatient unit locked up or you're locked up at Rikers, you're severing those ties to the community that you need. 
what are some ways we can use technology to sort of address these, these silos and break down these walls and provide these services mm -hmm. and supports? Well, I think, first of all, I really commend you, and I'm glad you're here because your, your, your program is just groundbreaking. It's incredibly important. I think that jails and prisons are dehumanizing places that even if you load them up with doctors and nurses and medicines, and even though we do like group therapy, none of that really gets at the core of the dehumanization, whereas a contact with a family member does. So it's just such important work. I think that, honestly, the best thing we can do is to keep people out of jail and prison. I think that we will struggle. I was in this room a month ago with uh, many, many uh, mentors, but among them Bob Greifinger and Nancy Dubler, who had pretty rough, well-informed assessments of how much you can make things better in jail and prison. And I think that I take them at their word that, the, you know, this side of the panel is where the hope is. <laughs> and we will continue to struggle, I think, with, with, with pioneers like you. Uh, but I think that the best thing we can do is to, to keep them out. Uh, other other questions? Yes, in the in the pink. Hi, I'm Mary Beth Anderson of the Justice Center Mental Health Project. I have two questions, and I think the first one is probably more for Homer, and the second one more for Steve, but anybody can chime in. Uh, the first question involves how correctional care is being provided, and I don't mean, you know, the medical side, I mean the correction side. Um, there was a movement in Maryland to do like uh, trauma-informed uh, care and uh, train people in trauma-informed care, everyone who worked in the facilities, and they found that it was pretty valuable. Do you think that model could be implemented here, and what sort of culture shifts would need to be implemented? And second, we find that uh, the problem for many people who are kind of cycling through over and over and over is housing. And part of the problem with that is that it's very difficult to interview people in detention. And, um, you know, what do people think would be valuable in trying to make that connection? Because we also are finding that people, I mean, people qualify for mental health housing, but they don't necessarily get in because they interview poorly. And then having to interview in jail, there aren't a lot of providers that go in. So I'd like to know what people think are some solutions to those problems. Um, you know, I'll just answer the first part. I think that, yes, it's completely possible and it's, it's vital. I think that just like in the community and the other parts of the criminal justice system in correctional settings, most of the systems are there to escalate conflict. There are individuals who de-escalate, but if you look. So that last time we were here with Nancy and, and all these other people for this great panel, the night before I'd been up because there was a person in a cell in a mental observation unit who was psychotic that needed to go to the hospital, but was like being, you know, psychotic, but not unknown to people in this room. And so at some point I found myself in his cell with him, but he was tired. On the other side of the door was a, a probe team that had come to get him. And this is this standard jail class standoff. Like my assessment was it was better for him to be psychotic and go to sleep because he was sleepy than to go through an extraction from a cell, go through the intake, go through this whole trauma. But but that might have been the bad that might also have been the wrong decision. You know, like I acknowledge that was not a precise <laughs> assessment. And I think that the we with, with the Department of Corrections have a lot of opportunity, and I think they're very engaged in this discussion right now about how to interact. And there are many, you know, I was at York uh, uh, Correctional Center in, um, it's the women's jail prison in Connecticut, where they have a mental health team. Part of it is the correction officers, the warden buys into this notion of mental health care. And I think that we have a lot of partners in the Department of Correction in New York City who are believe in that mission. And I think we will, we will, I think we will transform that, and I think that the you know the arrival of Commissioner Pont for their their agency, I think is the most important because culture predominates over all other discussions, and you don't change the culture of a uniform agency with you know health nerds or social work nerds or mental health nerds. You do it with uniform leaders that people buy into, and that I think is very promising. And the housing, I'll, I'll defer to. So, um, actually, the Corporation for Supportive Housing did a project a few years ago. It was called FUSE, it was Frequent Users of Services, and so we got funding to hire one uh, staff person, and the idea was to take people who were cycling through prisons and get them into our 
housing and then provides a little extra support to keep them there. So we took 20 people and 19 people stuck. So that was like six or seven years ago. Um, getting in this whole application system that's been created is incredibly, um, you couldn't get into my housing. You know, you would need somebody to like help you. Um, and so that, I mean, just some, maybe some resources in some way to bridge that uh, knowledge and technical gap between what is, and there are thousands of units coming online. There's tons of capital funding coming down with managed care reform. They've realized housing is a health solution for a lot of people. And if you can get people into housing, their health improves. And so um, part of the managed care reform is actually encouraging more housing development. But we need to figure out this the complex, you know, come over um, the barriers that exist. Um, if you're in a shelter, they'll, they'll, they'll get all the paperwork filled out for you. If you're not in a shelter, there, there's really hard, it's hard to find a place that you can have the psychosocial done and have this medical done. It's got to be done within a certain number of days. And then, then you got to get into the system and you got to enter the information into the HRA system. It's really challenging. I think just, just quickly on the second question about housing, I think that something which has been shown to be, I mean, to be effective, I know Steve does a lot of work with peers, with people who've had experience before of, of either being a mental health service consumer or someone who people who are formerly incarcerated, working to get people with that experience into correctional environments so that they can kind of partner with people, do some of this work, start the engagement with community services while people are still incarcerated through kind of in-reach programs. I think there's a lot of promise there. Again, we're working with uh, the Corporation for Supportive Housing in Los Angeles to think about a new project they have, um, which is um, called Just In Reach, which is, it, just, it does exactly this, kind of provides this um, continuous contact with somebody while someone's incarcerated and then they have, they know they have a friendly face, someone they know when they leave, and so that there's more of a continuity of kind of services. It doesn't get around the administrative hurdles of applying for housing in, in New York City, which I'm, I'm frankly less familiar with, but I think that kind of program has a lot of, has a lot of promise. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir. My name is Christian Claudio. I'm a residential care advocate for ACS. Um, there's a movement right now for Raise the Age campaign <clears throat> with our youth. And you have a lot of 16, 17 year olds going into Rikers Island as a result of committing crimes. Um, you know, obviously, in the placement facilities, they're dressed a little bit different than they are in Rikers Island. So, with that being said, uh, it's believed that their incarceration in Rikers Island is contributing to mental health issues and, and developing those mental health issues. So, uh, my question is. What are some of the, the, the diagnoses that you see, the, the mental health issues that they're developing, and uh, what's being done to address that, help them in, in those situations? So, you know, adolescents, if we look at the adolescents, and you just framed it very nicely, the 16, 17, 18 year olds who are in the jail system, we see, you know, less serious mental illness than we do in the adult population, but we see a lot of adjustment disorder, anxiety, some depression. There are also obviously people being identified with, uh, you know, bipolar disease and schizophrenia, certainly. I think that, however, you know, my comment earlier about the, the, the share of our work in the mental health service that really is simply tending to problems created by being in jail, that's much larger in the um, in the adolescent group, and so, you know, at any given time, about 20% of the adolescents are in the box, are in solitary. So many of them are doing things to get out, to stay out, to avoid it. And we're when we see them, giving them diagnoses. And so I think that the the New York City Board of Corrections, which has oversight over both us in the DOH and also the Department of Corrections, has engaged in rulemaking. But one of the things they stated just yesterday in their board uh, meeting that they were going to look at was, uh, you know, these age-specific, when they think about new rules, think about this age-specific uh, discussion, mostly about solitary confinement, but I think it's, it's part of this wider discussion, which is should you be treating, I believe it's just us in North Carolina, New York and North Carolina, that have 16, 17, 18-year-olds in the jails that you use for adults. Not to say that they're side by side, but it's these systems. So I think these are really important issues for us. We, you know, uh, try and do our best. We have a, a big mental health service in the adolescent jail. We have lots of providers. Uh, I would say, you know, most of it is is finding people with mental illness and caring for them as best we can. But some of it is, and and sometimes for the same people, is taking care of mental health exacerbations that are, at least in part, uh, a result of the health risk that the, that the jail conferred to them. 
Other questions? Yes, ma'am. My name is Leah Gitter. I'm a family member who has somebody currently actually going to court tomorrow. Um, and I think what's missing from this discussion is where are the ADAs and the judges who are administering this cruel uh, punishment to people? Because the prison population is not, the mentally ill is not going down. 4,000 at Rikers, 8,200 in the state system. The only population that went up and, and last year in the state system. And you have a panel with talking about very good things, but the ADAs, I know two cases where they are going, the case I'm involved in has a history that the current problem is nonviolent, and the ADAs won't hear anything about an alternative to incarceration. They should be up here with the judges who don't know anything about mental illness, discussing with you people what the heck is going on? 4,000 people at Rikers, it's ridiculous. And so this part is good, but the part that's doing the punishment needs to explain themselves to, to family members in particular and, and to everybody who's involved. Judge, Judge I'd, I'd phrase that as a question to you. I mean, you, you deal with ADAs all the time. What's your experience in terms of uh, ADAs' ability to, to handle uh, and assess mental illnesses? Well, you know, I think we've been lucky in Brooklyn because um, uh, it was the first county to have a mental health court, a drug treatment court, a domestic violence court, a Red Hook Community Court. And so the DA, and I'm assuming the new DA, I haven't seen any change with uh, DA Thompson, uh, is signing on to these two. So uh, again, we, I have a court that was planned as a nonviolent felony court, and yet we, the DA has been, the, the DA is the gatekeeper. Don't forget the DA has to be elected. So he's afraid of, of anything that might, as, as I am, you know, you don't want to be responsible for some innocent person being hurt, but they've been very good in terms of the types of cases that have been referred to the court. And even we talk about 16 and 17 year olds, we weren't gonna take <coughs> teenagers, but in criminal, we weren't gonna take misdemeanors either, but then the defense ball wanted us to buy it. And, and really, we didn't wanna take misdemeanors because we didn't want a net wide, we'd wanna criminalize mental illness. And we felt that, you know, a uh, person accused of a misdemeanor in, in the city generally doesn't go to jail for a long period of time, probably would be released within a couple of days if he serves any time at all. But the defense ball wanted us to help, and the DA's office too. So, you know, in Brooklyn, they've been very good. Now, it doesn't mean every district attorney is good. Every district attorney has uh, the knowledge that the one that is in my court does, but, you know, perhaps the district attorney's offices could do with some training, as judges do in terms of dealing with, uh, with problems associated with uh, people accused of, of a crime that suffer from a mental illness. Uh, we're going to take one more. We have time for one more question. Yes. Um, just to follow up on what you were saying, what Judge Devitt was saying, uh, because, uh, I'm sorry, Cheryl Parry is Kings County Hospital. Uh, we do uh, 730 competency evaluations, so we know Judge Devitt very well. Uh, but we also cover uh, Staten Island and Queens. And I'm just wondering about, in Brooklyn, there is one ADA who is special for mental health court, very experienced, really knowledgeable. But in some of the other boroughs, there isn't such a person. And that's and so it's a totally different experience. So I was wondering if you could comment about the different boroughs, different district attorney's offices. Well, we have the judge from Manhattan here. It was <laughs> terrific. So. <laughs> I, I, well, do you have a, a dedicated DA in your part? We actually have a dedicated bureau uh, assigned to um, the mental health court. And the way the process works in Manhattan is that the assigned assistant, the district attorney, has to consent um, to the case being referred to the mental health court, but that's not the end of it. Uh, at that point, the deputy has to go through the special litigation bureau. And there, the bureau chief and the deputy bureau chief and members of the bureau are trained specifically for this. So unless that bureau consents to the case coming to the mental health court, it will not come over. But in my experience, um, that bureau and, and the office is fully engaged. They're on board uh, with what we're trying to do. Uh, again, just as uh, with Judge Demick, as I already said, unless they consent, the case can't come over. But in my experience, they've been very reasonable. Uh, they've received specialized training. We have the same uh, ADAs appear every Friday for the calendar call, and we conference every case uh, before we even go on the calendar. Uh, so I'm sure there's cases where um, 
uh, reasonable minds will differ as to whether or not they should be in a mental health court or not. But I've only had to turn away fewer than 10 cases <coughs> that the DA's office has consented to. And so, non-violent cases in Manhattan, right? Well, actually, no, that was the plan. As in Brooklyn, that was the plan originally also, non-violent cases. As it turns out, the first graduate we had in Manhattan was someone who had been, uh, who pled guilty to committing a violent offense. And we take, uh, we take all kinds of cases now on a case-by-case basis. We take violent cases. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'd like to thank the, the panelists for, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Carla Rabinowitz, you want to your hand, uh, has petitions if you want to sign up for our crisis intervention, communities for crisis intervention teams. We're, uh, we're still in the organizing mode.